Luckily, I can hear the audio, so if you guys have something to say, obviously just feel free to chime in or put it in the chat, and we'll toggle back and forth. Thank cool. you. Great, yeah, thank you. Oh, well, thank you everybody for being here. Great to um, spend this time this afternoon with you guys talking about our high impact practices of undergraduate research. Um, so we're going to kind of be co-presenting this very informally. So um, my name is Beth Clipple. I'm a full-time faculty member in the science department. I teach in biology and biotechnology um, and have been um, involved in kind of doing some undergraduate research here at Triton recently and I'm excited to share experiences with you. Sheldon Turner, also science faculty. Uh, I'm in geology and environmental science uh, and been working with students on research in a lot of different ways over the last you know, three or four years or so. We've had different experiences, so we'll be talking about those uh, and how to do more going forward. I guess they can't see me unless I stand up, so I'll come over here. <laughs> anyway, uh, hi, I'm Rudy Gostowski. I teach chemistry. I've been involved doing undergraduate research since 1994, I think, when I was at the university. And then I worked at, at, at NASA and I had student interns there, so I uh, did it then. I was at, uh, while I was at NASA, I was at a place called Fisk University and HBCU in Nashville, Tennessee. And there were students doing projects there, and I've been doing stuff since I got here. Now I'm going to step back down. To the <laughs> okay. All right. All right, so we thought we would start off today just talking a little bit about what um, undergraduate research looks like, um, just to make sure it's kind of clear the types of projects that this research would encompass, right? Um, so the general idea behind undergraduate research is that we want students to be actively engaged in pursuing um, information, pursuing knowledge, and so they're applying the theoretical um, knowledge that they gain in the class to really solving real world problems and when possible using cutting edge technology that we have here on campus as well. So one way we sort of you know, think about what we've all done you know individually and collaboratively what sort of this uh, idea of undergraduate research brings uh, is sort of a different way of learning than we do in our normal classroom right so even in a science classroom where we're doing labs it's very hands-on Generally, you know, I give the students, I tell them what question they're working on. I give them all the equipment and how they're going to do it. They then collect the stuff and write up sort of the results. And I already know what the answer is going to be, right, or what it should be if they did it right. <coughs> With undergraduate research, right, really authentic science um, or you know, social science or whatever, any authentic data collection and analysis, um, the students sort of get to pick the questions, right? And that's the hard part is how do you ask a good question that can lead to research. Um, but the student and the faculty design the project together, right, instead of the faculty telling them how to do it. And then at the end, I have no idea what the answer is going to be, right? That's the most fun part of doing this kind of research is like anything could come out of this um, that you didn't expect. Um, and then you sort of figure that out together. So it's a much more collaboration between the faculty and the student instead, instead of sort of the top down, I'm showing you how to do science, I'm showing you how to do research, it's more we're doing research together. So one of the reasons why um, undergraduate research, or several reasons I should say, why undergraduate research is considered to be a high impact practice is, as you can imagine, especially for those of you that maybe had an experience as an undergraduate being able to do research, you kind of know what it means for you, right? Um, so things like um, making it clear in your mind what your trajectory is, you're like kind of committing to a career path, seeing yourself in that in that field and being able to actually contribute meaningfully to the field. Um, we do know that students that are engaged in this type of research tend to gain expertise as well, right? Because they're getting chance to utilize the tools and to apply their knowledge. Um, and so they become more confident and that helps them to kind of commit to a path and stay on a path as well. In addition, um, we have the fortunate situation of being able to actually solve real world problems. So we can see some direct applicability between what the students are learning in the classroom and how they can actually utilize the, that knowledge and those skills. Um, 
of course, it looks good on their resume, so it helps them move on to the next steps as well. So it's really good for resume building. It's really good for um, building communication skills, especially as many of our students get to present their findings um, at various symposiums, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of pretty much it. It does also, as I kind of indicated here at this last bullet point, it cultivates an understanding of the scientific process. So some of our students are kind of surprised when we don't know the outcome of the experiment and because we're, they're so used to us knowing that. And some of our students are surprised at um, how iterative the, the process of research looks like. So you start somewhere and it might take you somewhere you didn't expect and then you have to kind of adjust accordingly. Um, and that kind of experience is really powerful in helping them to understand more clearly how science unfolds and how research unfolds. And we have, I mean, we have a lot of anecdotes. There's a lot of data and research behind all of this, right? There's a whole literature review, but we all have just three of us a lot of experience with our students who have done this. Going on, I mean, this whole part about enhancing your resume, like our students are now already at the universities. They're doing really well. They're in careers. Some of them are publishing papers now. They are real scientists. They're peers as scientists, as seniors, right? Because of what they got to do when they were a freshman or sophomore here, right? Um, to to that end, we actually have some of our success. Oops, sorry. Some of our success stories highlighted here, some of the projects that we've un undertaken. Um, so lots of, we could spend, like I'm sure yeah. Rudy could spend this whole time just of all the success stories he has. <laughs> um, but you know, just some of our students, some of the things we've done. So we see a few students out here we're going to the, the Des Plaines River, the Chicago River. Those are projects where we tied into projects that were already happening in our community. So things that the water reclamation districts were doing, things that the park services were doing tying into their stuff, helping, giving them sort of man hours and labor and giving the students that experience. Other ones, um, like I worked with this, this group of students here, uh, it was completely a student idea. A couple of students were in my class. They had this weird question that was way outside what we talk about in my class, but I'm like, let's see if it works. And we designed the experiment, they did it. And they got to present at the ILSAMP conference uh, a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic. Uh, so presenting again, you know, they did a poster, um, students from all over the state, from you know, universities, and you know, some of them you know, are, are bigger universities like U of I, and there was a competition to see who had the best poster. They took you know, third place against University of Chicago and UIC and all these other schools. Um, just with the research they did you know, in one of our rooms, in one of our labs here on campus. Uh, so they can really be successful. And Rudy's had a lot of success with Ilsanth and other projects well, if you want to give a couple yeah, of examples. Um... Uh, Umu Torre up here, she's probably most significant. She was the uh, team leader for NASA Mines Project. And uh, she went on to a couple different internships. Uh, she did the NASA, uh, let's see, what is it, aerospace uh, scholars for community college students. And she's now a uh, electrical engineering student at IIT. And uh, down here, this is her and these guys are brothers um, and we're working on a prototype of a rocket thruster that we've now gone on to uh, going to manufacture in metal. There's a local company that Antigone put me on to uh, that has volunteered to do it for free to do the machine. So we hope to be able to test that thing eventually. Well, another example of the success is like both of these students now are at IIT uh, with $25,000 a year scholarships. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're hoping to continue that kind of stuff. So these students are really going on and being successful, not only because it's, these were good students already, that's why they took the time to sort of do this kind of research, but it really gave them that leg up to get into these good schools to get those scholarships. There. And then one other thing that was kind of highlighted in Rudy's example as he was talking about kind of working with Antigone, that's one of the greatest things about these types of projects is that they almost instantly become interdisciplinary. So they provide opportunities for us to work together across disciplines, as well as for students to be able to see how research is multifaceted and get, a, get an idea of the contributions that different fields can make for a broader research problem. All right, so now that we have talked a little bit about what the research um, experiences that we have have looked like and talk a little bit about what undergraduate research is overall. Um, we thought maybe it'd be a good opportunity for you to start kind of brainstorming what this might look like regardless of your discipline. So obviously in the sciences, it translates pretty easily because we are kind of always focused on research and looking at the literature and what it's showing us. 
but even in fields across campus, we can see how this type of model can be applied to really help to cultivate a more um, robust kind of culture of research here at Triton. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so just to give a couple examples before we let you sort of develop and think about your, your own ideas, and that's the sort of the guided activity we have here, uh, especially if you're in like the social sciences or the humanities outside of our traditional labs, uh, there's a lot of really good research that can be done here on campus and fairly cheap. You know, it takes a lot, right, to like run labs, stuff, but there's a lot of things, uh, especially um, before I came to Triton, I was teaching a course at a university on social research methods for environmental science and so there's a lot you can do with like interviews and surveys as another way to collect you know sort of human data uh, and there's a lot of really good resources like google forms that you know if you can distribute out the link enough like you can collect a lot of good information and do a lot of research with those google forms it's such a simple thing but students can really develop a whole project and write papers just on the information they collect there if you want to get out to a, a really wide audience you know there's um has anyone ever heard of or used Mechanical Turk? It's a thing that Amazon uh, has, and it's basically you can make these little tiny questions and sort of uh, human input things, like maybe one question on a survey or something, but you pay people like one cent per question or something like that, or five cents for a two question survey. And you can very quickly collect, overnight you could collect you know, thousands of data points from people across the world um, on things like that. So there's lots of ways that, again, for a few bucks, you can collect a lot of information. Um, you know, usually not more than the cost of printing a survey or an interview. Um, so if that's the kind of, you know, types of things, there's a lot more we could talk about uh, in terms of that. So again, don't limit to just like the thinking of our sort of setting of, you know, doing something in a laboratory. There's a lot we can do uh, outside of that too. So, um, you know, an example is like in business, I had some students once that um, were, were business students and they were looking at like public perceptions of corporate social responsibility. So like they're looking at different companies and they're advertising and does that, has that changed the way people think about which, you know, which product they're going to buy or asking about people's water drinking habits. Are they, what, do they drink water bottle or tap water and why, right? A bunch of really great, you know, student you know, their term papers and stuff came out of that. So students can collect that not knowing what their answers are going to be. And I think that's, you know, with the, the power of this. So for you thinking about your own research possibilities, um, we've just developed these quick sort of five questions that come from uh, this sort of um, guide that I've attached here. So these are some colleagues of mine um, in geoscience, but these things apply to any sort of research, even outside the sciences. And it's sort of the questions, if this is something you want to try doing, if you want to try doing this high impact practice, what are some things you should ask yourself first to get it started? Um, and so, you know, the first one is why, right? We're thinking about assessment too, like what, what are the things we're trying to achieve with this? What do we want our students to learn? Uh, and some examples are, you know, is this about problem solving, time management, sk certain skills, confidence, creativity? Sort of prioritize those, right? Which are the ones you really want your students to get? You know, all of them are important, but what are the ones you're gonna focus on? That will help guide that design, right? So if you look on sort of the, the next page, this designing effective undergraduate projects, it's got a little bit of those examples of what are some of those things you want them to get? And then we have the second question, who is the student? Uh, and again, what this is really getting you to try to think about are what are the research questions they might want to ask? Um, what courses, you know, what is the experience level of these students? Is this something where their students would need to have already taken a bunch of stuff in your field? Or can your brand new, you know, fresh out high school students that have never taken your discipline before do this? Um, is this going to be something that students will do in, you know, one at a time or as groups? Um, how, you know, and then some of this is you've just got to learn the students, right? Some students are better at having a lot of input. Some of them want to do it on their own. And you got to sort of that, you'll have to know the student uh, before you can bring it there. And then this funny question, who are you, right? I'm not asking you for your name. <laughs> this is really about what do you see your role as? And this is the big, I would say one of the biggest things of working with our students is figuring out, you know, are you just uh, supporting them? Are they doing all the work and you're just there to make sure they are staying safe and you're there to make sure they're doing things right? Are you really advising them and teaching them a skill set? Um, you know, or how, right, how much are you in the charge? How much are they in charge? I think I'll just adding on to that. Yeah, One of the other things that you want to reflect on when you're kind of thinking about who you are, 
as a reflection of the kinds of questions your students are asking is what are the limitations of your skill set? Yeah. So, for example, <laughs> on the micromediation project that Dr. Turner and I were working on, or Sheldon and I were working on, um, we quickly realized that there was some chemistry going on that we just needed some expertise on. So we tapped onto Rudy's shoulder, right? So being able to understand, like, if you're helping these students cultivate their own questions, you're probably going to run into see your, some of your own limitations as well and knowing who you'll be able to access on campus yeah. that might help you to still continue the pursuit of answering that question um, while working within your own Very limitations. much so. Yeah. And that's that's why we started to ask, because the student questions started getting places like, I have no idea how to do that. I don't even know the, the analytic techniques at this point. So we reached out and we started working together. And we had a much better project because of that collaboration. Uh, but also ask yourself, like, how much time do you have to work on this? And this is something we will want to talk about at the end, but um, it's, so right now, it's, sort of, it's usually like volunteer stuff. You're doing this outside of you know your class. The students are doing it outside of their class. So how many hours a week can you really dedicate to doing this? Uh, again, um, unless it's somehow formalized as an individualized study or something like that, um, you know, if, if this is just sort of an extracurricular curricular thing you're doing, it can be a lot of time. Um, especially, maybe there's certain things you have to collect at a certain time, or if you're trying to eventually then, you know, maybe have the students go to a presentation, go to a conference, there might be a lot of work getting ready for that conference, you know. So it's going to ebb and flow as things go on. The students' time is going to change. So how much can you, you know, you don't want to promise the students a bunch of stuff and then you can't actually keep up with them. Um, or can you get help? And that was a nice thing working together. We could sort of, as one of us couldn't do something, the other one could. So having a multiple faculty in a group, I think, is a really great idea to help with that. Um, yeah. So it's, that's what I really mean by like, who are you? What what skills do you have? What time do you have? How, what is your relationship to the students? Um, but also getting at something as, at the end, I have a separate question is like, what resources do you have available to you? Not just your own internal skill sets, but like, what is your department? What is, you know, what does the school have to help you out with that? Um, so that's, who are you? The fourth part, this is thinking a little bit about what do you want to, the students to get out of this? Are they going to write a report for themselves? Are you going to try having them present at a conference with a poster, with a presentation? You know, do you know what conference that is? There are a lot of really great student conferences around here. Uh, North, Northern Illinois, um, no, Northeastern Illinois University does a student symposium. Uh, we had our students uh, present there. Uh, they gave a, a poster presentation there, a bit virtual one since it was during the pandemic, but they have an on-campus one. Um, Rudy's going to talk about a little bit like, could we be doing that on campus? If we got enough people doing, uh, you know, sort of this, this this type of work, could we have a symposium here on campus for our students? But there's a lot of them around in your different disciplines. Are they going to go to a professional conference, right? Are you going to bring them to a professional conference and get to learn that side of things as well as then present themselves as students? And what we've seen is our students, you know, our first year and second year college students can handle their own at these, you know, big events and these professional conferences. They're really, uh, really remarkable. Their, their confidence once they get there. I think they're really scared of getting up to it, but afterwards they're like, that wasn't bad at all. Like, you know, they, was, everyone was so friendly. And exactly. You know, they don't, they don't realize that. Um, and then the last one is related to like, do you need any money to do what you're doing? Again, especially sometimes in science, this is, there's a lot of equipment, a lot of chemicals we might need or other things, but that doesn't mean in other types of things. If, if you're doing interviews, do you have all the recording equipment? Do you have the rooms? Do you have the space? Um, if not, where can you get that? There are lots of little pots of money on campus. There are lots of pots of money at the national level, at the state level. So how do you get that ahead of time um, to help you make, make this kind of stuff happen? You know, if you want to send those students to a conference, how are we paying for you know, their registrations and their transportation and stuff? Um, so those are all things to keep in mind. So oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is anybody familiar with the Illinois Academy of Science? Have you done anything with them? I've not. I I joined, but I never did anything. But you know, they have an annual meeting. They welcome students to come there and present, and they have an opportunity for the student to get some money to help with the project. So that's an avenue that I have not pursued, but I think that we should look into that further because they definitely seem to be wanting people to be involved. So I think we want to give everyone a little time to start sort of maybe writing down answering some of these questions for yourself and then we can either come around or we can just talk as a group since there's not very many of us of like what you came up with. What are your sort of struggles with this? Which questions are you having trouble answering or get experience from again around the room? Uh, 
Afterwards, you see I put up one website here. There's lots of good references on the back, but the one is CUR, C-U-R, the Council for Undergraduate Research. That is sort of the, the biggest organization that's really puts out a lot of resources for doing uh, this, this particular high impact practice. So uh, for answering, helping you answer all of these questions. So hopefully you check that out too. But we're also here, we've been doing it. So um, take some time. Uh, I don't know how long we're we'll sort of check the room like in class and see how you guys are all doing, but we'll come around and help answer questions and that kind of stuff. And then um, for Angela and Gretchen, do you have a digital copy of this that's accessible? Yeah, I'll have to. I just, type these questions into the chat? Do you want to do that for now? Yeah, because yeah, it's just that yep. I don't have it no easily problem. accessible other than that email. Yeah, yeah, so. no problem. Okay. But I can send that out to you. Yeah, yeah. You guys okay, so Angela and Gretchen, I'm just going to type in. So the questions that we're, we are kind of thinking of um, exploring as we try to picture putting undergraduate research in our own. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to put them in here, um, and you can start thinking about it, and we'll share the documents with you as well. Um, so the, the first one is the longest, so just give me my, my chicken type typing here. How are these students who went to these projects? Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about this select group, not the entire students. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. Like, a lot of these projects have maybe four to eight students. I would say I haven't seen many. I don't know, have you any, any groups bigger than that? No. Yeah, so oh, wait a minute. No, well, I guess, yeah, Rocket stuff, yes. There's a lot of people there. Um, okay. Let's see, I think it's maybe it's between six and eight on yeah. this team. So, yeah, and that's the thing. If you do have bigger groups, so you could break them into teams. But it's hard for that much more than maybe eight. And that's pretty high already. I would say four to five is probably a good number. Yeah. And again, with the number of faculty we have, there's no way every single student could participate in this unless we had a really concerted effort as an institution to sort of make, make this happen. So, and again, uh, so far, this has mostly been some of it's been related to grants, like some of this came from like the Genius Grant or the NASA Minds Grant, but a lot of it is still just sort of volunteer at this point, both on the student's time as well as on the, the faculty's time. Um, we would like that to be, but that's sort of where we need more people doing it, have examples of it, and then maybe eventually it could be things where there is some sort of incentive for it. Um, so yeah, that incentive that. thing is, is, is an issue, you know, they're not getting paid, they're getting course credit. Uh, I, I even struggled trying to get it put on their transcript, and I never got anywhere with it. I promised, but it never happened. So, um, so anyway, uh, until we get past that with either course credit or at least it's guaranteed to be on transcript, or the best thing would be, of course, if they got a stipend. Because as it is, when I say I've got eight students working on the thing, yes. it might be actually three or four really doing it. Maybe mm -hmm. one person, like. Um, Last time, last year, I only had one guy that could do CAD. Only person. This year, I only had one guy that could do CAD. Different guy, uh, and some of the other people are, are learning it, and that's on that on that project. On another project, uh, there's a person who seems to be able to do CAD. I haven't seen it in the final version of it. But it some of these like students that. are exceptional. Yes. Right, whichever kind of high impact practice you throw at them. Yeah. They'll use it yeah. right to their benefit, right? Sure. Which creates even more of a like differential between the rest of the group, uh -huh. right? Yeah, and at sure. least so. If I'm just thinking out loud, like the different levels where we can introduce a little bit of research, it could be a term paper, right? mm -hmm. it could be an internship. So, like when I did my bachelor's, doing an internship was a requirement. You will not get your degree unless you've had an internship, right? I have to do an internship. 
then we had the final year design project, right? But the final year design project is a year-long project, mm -hmm. and you're doing a lot. So for this thing to be an effective, high-impact practice, how can we tailor it in a way where it's either part of every course, right? But rather than having disjointed labs, maybe we can combine some of the labs and make it like a give it a certain percentage. That's true, Max. That's a really oh, yeah. good point. Yeah, absolutely. So having that kind of financial assistance would be really key, I think, to integrating it more uniformly. Um, and then as far as like access and self-selection, because that is a challenge, right, for um, any of these kind of extracurricular opportunities that you offer out, um, those students that are high achieving are going to be the ones that tend to gravitate towards it. Um, but that's one of the reasons why it's important to um, at least still make the offer and to try to make the um, the research meaningful to students so that they're the ones that are kind of thinking about like what is important to me um, because then they're more likely to want to follow through and commit to the project as opposed to again it kind of being you're directing what um, what they're focusing on but yeah I think the self-selection is always going to be an issue without it being a requirement but one of the things you can get that is um, so a lot of these groups you might have like one student who can sort of tell right away sort of the lead, right? Maybe it was their original idea or something, but especially if you're talking about it maybe in your classes and things, you get more students, you know, so like that, there was that one where they went and did the poster. That really started with one student and then another student in the same class sort of joined on. But then by talking about it with other classes and other students sort of hearing about it, the other, the rest of the group sort of formed. And they weren't all necessarily these like super high achieving students that were already going on in science. Some of them weren't even science majors. Uh, they just thought it was really interesting. Uh, now, some of them, what this sometimes does, though, is they'll switch majors because of this, right? They find it yeah. so fascinating, yeah. or they find an aspect of it, like, they now realize, like, oh, I was, you know, I, I was knew I wanted to do business. I wasn't sure what. Now I know this is where I want to apply, you know, sort of my business skills, right? So um, if you're broad with sort of who it's recruited to, I think you can pull these teams together. And, and that's actually better teams than when they all have different experiences and backgrounds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would need to be, you need a, a lot of people doing this to really make a huge across campus. But at the same time, we do want to serve even those those really good students. We also want to get them to achieve even further, right? Get them to even better schools than they could have and get them those scholarships. Um, but I, I think it can be done. But yeah, any sort of advertising you can do, any sort of you can help is a way to do it. Yeah, I think those are all great ideas, Maxie, to try to yep. kind of start just to promote that culture. But I think the other thing is, um, you know, one of the things that we try to do it to be as inclusive as possible is being cognizant of like, okay, you guys want to be part of this project, so can you at least meet with us virtually? Like, even if you can't physically come here, can you come one time and contribute what you can, so that the students that are like, well, I can't come every single week and be, but they can still be part of it. And so I think that trying to be more inclusive in that regard and being cognizant of you know, students that have a lot more outside of the classroom obligations than others, um, and trying to really to modify the formatting um, and give them opportunities to contribute where they yeah. can. So even if it's not as significant as somebody else, they're still part of that team. Um, so yeah, I think, Rich, did you have something to add or no? Oh, it's just more kind of a question, because I'm, I mean, I know we have like an honors program here, but yeah. I know for me, like an undergrad, it was like part of the curriculum was like a Kind of like like that as well, where you know you were part of your graduation requirement was you know being involved in some kind of research project. I don't mean like I don't know how. I don't know if that's something that we can like approach them to see like not necessarily as a requirement, but like as an option perhaps, yeah. and you know as part of their yeah curriculum. I think but, they have like a service requirement or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and a lot of this stuff can be a service project too. Yeah. That's you know, this relates into a lot of those other high impact practices of like service learning. Like the first one I worked on with the Chicago River, we were directly working with the community and again with all the, the agencies that work with it. and all their data that they collected went straight to you know engineers that then sort of took that and made the next you know twenty year plan for the Chicago River with the information that our students collected. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can, I, I think it's great to tie into that project. Yeah, because a lot of us, right, had those sort of honors mm -hmm. thesis. Now, we're only a two-year program, but, right. you know, we got to be careful what will transfer and not transfer. That's the hard thing with classes is that research experience, you know, these things might not be transferable. You know, they're not like IAI-type courses, but that's another
other option. Yeah, I realized that what I said about the 3D model uh, situation or the CAD, um, that was just one aspect of it. We've got a couple people that are doing computer science aspects of it, and that's what their thing is. And then we have this one young lady, and she's just an organizer that gets everything done. She understands everything, but only to a certain degree. Uh, but she is conversive with the, the people that are working on the CAD and working on the computer science. And I want to add on what Maxie was saying up here. Uh, anyway, uh, she was talking about creating scholarships for undergraduate research activities. When I came out of grad program, uh, I was working in a place called Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. And um, I started doing undergraduate research right off the bat. And Boy, she's, she types fast. Uh, anyway, uh, and so um, I became friends with our grants office, uh, the person that had the grants office, and we figured out that we could go to the president and say, why don't you make a scholarship, call it the Presidential Research Scholarship, you know, presidential, and then, um, and then pass out some money. And I think it was 4,000 or 3,000 per student, five students, and they had certain requirements they had to meet to get that. I don't remember what they were at this point. I could probably find it. But anyway, that's a great one if some, you know, if uh, they were willing to do that at that level. Yeah, it's an interesting so, way to Because that certainly makes it a lot easier because they're no longer having to be a barista or work at McDonald's or sell clothes or be a carpenter or whatever it is they do to actually pay so they can live. And wrapping back around to like this sort of equity issue, how do you get, especially with our students, right, who, you know, are doing all sorts of, they, they leave campus and they go all sorts of different ways, uh, is that what you're mentioning about like breaking it, especially when you start to design the project, you figure out all the different pieces that go into that. Again, it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, right, there's always like a literature review, right, there's always sort of the project development, there's a data collection aspect. Students, whether by skills or just time, like I remember that the one project um, with the sort of worm waste and stuff we did. Uh, some one student had, you know, had a, a kid that they really had to be there for all the time, couldn't really stay after in the afternoons and stuff. But she was able to do almost a lot of the literature review, right? She was able to sort of use all the resources, pull together all the things, you know, help them <coughs> sort of write the paper piece while other students maybe were doing the actual data collection, right? And, that's where the student teams, I think, can really help with that. And they, they all get those skills, but they all sort of get the specialized too. And which is an authentic experience of what it's going to be like when they're, you know, whether in a research lab at a university or when they're working someday. Uh, they're going to be in these teams of multiple people. But we really want it to not just be, again, we're all scientists. We want this to, it has to be across campus, like lots of disciplines doing this kind of stuff for it to really gain traction to work. If we want to get scholarship, we want to get funding, it needs to go beyond just, um, just science. Again, I think it, we lend, it lends itself well, but we need to think of other ways and other people can be involved. Um, and I, I think, Max, you, you provide some really great um, ways to try to pull in students into this kind of work. Um, so I, I love the examples that you've given. So asking them what they're passionate about, having them start to think about what kinds of questions they would want to ask. Um, building on their favorite courses, maybe re helping them reflect on how they can use their experience and their knowledge to kind of get at something that they're passionate about. Um, class assignments are always a good place for this to start, right? So um, I don't know, I think the origins of like the microremediation project, yeah. right? A student learned about this idea of using fungal organisms to clean up pollution and was like, wow, I want to see that in action, right? So kind of tying together your coursework with your passion. Um, and again, using those skills, and then that's a great resource, the VCU, the VCU research website. We'll definitely make sure to um, follow up on that too. Thank you, Maxie, for all of that information. And you know, and, and another example, what I was asking, like how do you then hit more students with it? For example, this project we did, where some students presented at a conference on this project where they're looking at pollution and how mushrooms might help it. Um, that's now a little piece of that, since we found there's certain pollutants we found that we didn't quite get a chance to explore in detail. That leads itself to the next research project, or I'm actually taking a little piece of that and doing that in my class this semester. So the students, and it's actually a lecture class, but the students are actually going to be collecting some data on river water and get a chance to see some of the stuff they're learning about in lecture 
in action, and then that gives them something to now research. Instead of saying, okay, go research this type of pollutant, they're going to actually measure that pollutant, find it, and then have to go learn about it and think about strategies to, to fix it, that kind of thing. So you can get these good in either, or you, you can have a good idea in class that becomes a research project. You have good research project ideas that can become term projects and term papers and that kind of thing. We have a discussion going on in Guided Path at Pillar 4 right now. Okay. So ensuring learning. And we were looking at all the instructional strategies that are on on the on the, on the form, the curriculum form. Yeah. And the discussion is about doing away with lecture. Yeah. Right. Because lecture has been around for so long, it's turning into an ineffectual uh, teaching strategy. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to go completely away, but just to uh, get that point across that we need to start, you know. Thinking about other yeah. uh, other methodologies, other combinations. So maybe research can become an integral part of each course. Uh, so you know, we've been looking at. I've been looking at University of Leicester, which is teaching physics without any lecture the whole semester. So they are it's complete nothing. But if you look at other people who are actually doing it, teaching science without any lecture whatsoever, and there are other combinations present as well. Can we think of a situation where including research as part of every course, because then it would become inclusive. It's a little bit of aspect of equity as well, that you basically can, you know, giving those skills to every student, not just the best student. So can it be part, and how can we go about, you know, making it part of every course as an instruction strategy? Well, and if you think about again all the steps of research. Um, I think it can touch a lot of like information literacy and quantitative literacy. Again, regardless of what discipline you're doing that research in, uh, you know, just working with numbers and having real numbers you collected is a lot different than just being given a data set and saying, okay, graph it, right? But it's something you collect, that student collected, that they you know, sort of have ownership over those numbers. Uh, so I think there's a lot of our sort of gen ed outcomes can be done through this type of you know, student research. And I think um, Rudy will touch on a little bit later, like this idea of creating a culture of research and then how that can transcend into curricular changes as well. I think the, um, you know, the hope is that this is the tip of the iceberg and that as we get more momentum and more traction and it becomes more universal across disciplines, that it becomes something that is more readily recognized and this is a primary, um, you know, instructional strategy that we fall into. But I think that we, we need to kind of moving forward to be able to get to that point. Awesome. All right, so what disciplines do we have in the classroom, just or in, in the room today? Just curious. I know um, that yeah. Dr. Chan. Biology, microbiology. Mm -hmm. right. I teach English. English, perfect. But, um, I do work for an advertising agency, oh, and I have okay. had up um, interns, paid internships, actually, nice. where we collect data for media. Wonderful. Um, and it's really, really interesting. Yeah. We have a, uh, sometimes the agency actually pays for those interns to come and work specifically on a project. And I've headed one, several, actually. So when you were talking earlier about the component of gathering all the research and writing the data and presenting it, yeah. um, that's my specialty is because um, you know I teach English. But it's very, very interesting. I've actually had students in my class here that I've included in those internships and nice. who've actually come to work for me. At that's the really cool. As a result. That's really um, wonderful. It's very interesting. That's a great, great example. I think, and that can again, those type of skills translate to so many other fields. And like, that's where even like our science students could probably use a lot more of some of that. That the back end piece of like, how do we disseminate what we learn now? Right. Right, and it's really important because I think what happens, especially in this internship, is that you know they're in focus groups. Some of them are in focus groups and showing them different ads or different colors of things yeah. and getting their feedback um, from people in the room. Others are going to um, media data and yeah. getting that from commercials that have aired and yeah. how many times they flip up their you know, commercial or yeah. what position is it best. And it depends on who we're doing the research for. Sure. We do a lot for, uh, for a, a company in Austin, Texas, but we do U.S. Air Force. We do a lot of testing. But even the videos that we do, the training videos that we do, 
Um, and we just worked on a really huge product, a, a video game. Um, it's an app that is the coolest thing in the whole world. We've worked on it for a very, very long time. But we had gamers involved in it, sure. right? So you collect all that kind of data and then putting all the research together, kind of selling it to the client yeah. as this would be a great app and this is a reason why we can get uh, recruiting them for reference and stuff yeah. like that. So it's really, really interesting. Yeah. And even as you're talking, I'm kind of seeing how this is intersecting between like psychology and business and computer science, and yeah. that's one of the other really but, great things about kind of, kind of coming back to this interdisciplinary nature of some of these really interesting research questions, um, and how we can support each other. So yeah. that's a and wonderful it's a, example. It's a longer project. I mean, I've had that when we were doing the video game for uh, Air Force. It was over a year, mm -hmm. and so we had interns for one semester, and then interns for another semester and just to see the differences yeah. that each each semester or each person brought to the table yeah. and a different way of looking at it yeah. was insightful for us. We learned a lot for about sure. what we needed to do, approaches that we needed to take as well. Awesome. It was interesting. Very cool. Um, I teach hospitality management specifically for yeah. uh, courses. And I, I can see how um, this approach to research um, project could be really useful in, in our industry. Definitely. Um, moving forward to going back to the drawing board and kind of looking up some things. That's wonderful. That's awesome. And it looks like Gretchen has a pretty good example here for us as well. Uh, so they do a yep. research project in marketing. So they formulate the quantitative and qualitative questions. They go around campus asking these 10 questions to at least 25 students. They take the data, present it back their findings. Um, oh, that's interesting. So the question last year was, what makes you view it a whole TikTok video versus swiping <laughs> to the next? That's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the and this is this kind of gets at the heart of like make, making questions that are really valuable to the students, right? This is something that that's that's their that's their jam. So being able to kind of allow them to see how again their skills can apply to things that they're interested in is really key. And yeah, and I think that there's there can be a lot of great examples in hospitality as well. So exciting. I teach anatomy and physiology. I think this the 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 thing is is good, but the the, the only problem I think as this is the, to the time. The she made mention of uh, of one project going on for a year. Yeah. But sometimes some of these projects and especially in, 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 in sciences, in biology, microbiology can last more than the two, two years yep. we're talking about. Yep. To be able to get at something very good. So that's just, that's the only limitation I'm looking at today. So it's only if you want to break it into stages. Yep. As the, this group will get this far, like here, as rightly said, then from what developed from there, yep. another group. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. And I think that that is an important, you know, kind of um, filter to have as you're approaching what kinds of experiments and what kinds of research you can conduct, knowing that our students are only here for a short period of time, knowing that they're not, you know, widely available for all hours of the day, to try to break it into manageable pieces that could then roll over into something larger. I think that's a really great point. Yeah, you need to find something like big enough where it's exciting, right, whatever they find, but it has to be small enough where, yeah, they can just take a piece. So a lot of times it's, you know, there might be 20 variables they want to collect, and you help them narrow down, okay, like, let's just see, or we do a little survey, we, we kind of like, which one can we actually talk about? Um, you know, we started off in our project collecting tons and tons of different pollutant data, but we decided, like, the students are only going to be able to focus on one or two, and we ended up just really focusing on chloride on one of them out of all the stuff we started with, and the students sort of got to pick which one they thought was the most important. Mm -hmm. But that now we have all these other sort of pilot pieces that the next student group could take, and that's the way to go about doing it. Sure. Yeah. But you wanted them to get something out of it. You want them to do, finish something so they can say, hey, look, I did this project, not, oh, I got to the research question part, and that's as far as we got before we graduated. You've really got to keep it moving without pushing too hard. Yeah. You know, that's, the, that's the toughest part about advising and mentoring these students. Yeah. Part one. <laughs> thinking about like if we have an ongoing project and you can also take the same project and split it into different segments yeah. and assign a different segment to each group. Yeah. 
So then you have collaboration within groups, uh, communication of what what part they are solving. Yep. Yeah. So that that will from, from small team they're going to a much larger team. Yep. In that kind of thing, I think you know it's almost like the, the jigsaw teaching strategy, where it's you know which works well in a classroom. I think when you have you know a bunch of students, it is harder if you're doing this outside to have multiple teams going, because uh, that's a lot of time. I knew unless you're working on a faculty team, that's another thing to keep in mind. But that it's I love that idea. We've tried I've tried that idea, but it ends up being too many. You're, 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 you spread yourself too thin. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you gotta you gotta be careful. That's where the sort of who are you question that we had on that. Yeah, that thing. But sure. In a classroom, I think that works really well to have sort of teams and sub teams. Um, I'm doing that this semester where like the overall students are attacking the same problem, but that's broken up into smaller groups of some are attacking this stage, some are attacking this stage, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's a great idea. And I was yeah. thinking of hey, do you have uh, any office for IRB institutional review board. Great question. Yeah, for yeah. these two Yeah. So uh, I didn't, we didn't put a slide of that, but I did write a few notes. Uh, having worked with some of this stuff before, um, especially with grants and things, we don't have a technically like IRB committee on campus, like a university or something, but our research office acts as an IRB. Uh, so if, again, you are doing any human research or animal research, um, you can sort of write it up the same way you would write up. You know, in any other university research, we send it to our research office, and they'll sort of uh, they'll approve it. And then, if it needs to, it'll get sort of the president's signature if it gets that far. Especially if you're thinking like maybe this is publishable data, um, anything like that, you want to get that. But yeah, or if it's grant funded, like a National Science Foundation, they require you to have IRB approval. So internal review board, if you haven't worked with that before, but just human subject research, we do have. But it's very much a open-ended protocol here because we're not a research institution. I. Before the pandemic, I had started getting traction on like a sort of official protocol uh, for IRB stuff, but it um, sort of fell apart. But the research office is interested uh, in you know any help with making it more formalized and quicker, especially if we get enough people doing research, especially human subject research. I think that could really help. You know, when it was just my one example, they were like, "Well, we'll try. We'll do our best." But if we had lots of people that wanted to do it, I think it would help build that momentum. To that. And then we can have a form, and you just fill out the form instead of you having to start from scratch writing your IRB proposal. But uh, and again, I'm happy to share and talk more about that. I have a quick question, I guess, because um, I know a lot of, I mean, at least in the sciences, I know a lot of our students who are like clinically driven. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if there's, I mean, because I'm just more curious to see if there's any way to get any collaborations with any like clinical research projects mm -hmm. like going on, say, I mean, maybe not even necessarily. You know, taking the lead here, but maybe you know, collaborating with somebody at like Northwestern yeah. or you know, Rush or something like that to see if we can have any just even just have students like help with like data collection or data analysis that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know yeah. what the you know what that would look like, but sure. you know. I mean, I think you know, there there's the more formalized setting of like the RU program where students can kind of work with universities as part of that that program. Um, I know, were you on the email from from Sue? There, I just got an email like last week about a potential for collaboration um, under an NSF grant. So I think that there's a kind of mixes of that. I think it really depends on coming back again to who you are. What kind of connections do you have, right? I mean, we're fortunate that we have so much talent and so much access amongst our faculty body um, of different organizations. And so I think that even if it was more informal or more like you kind of paved the path yourself, um, as long as you could get approval for whatever that might require, I think yeah. that you know the research questions really are limitless in that regard. Yes. If that makes sense. And we do have a grants office that you know, especially small, if you have small grants, you know, there are giant NSF grants and stuff. Those are a lot more work, and we have gotten them. They do exist, but you know, and they even will break them down by you can see like, okay, you're in the humanities, what? What local foundations are funding student work in the humanities, or your business? What foundations and stuff are funding that? So if you haven't looked at that yet, you know, check out some of the, the stuff that the grants office puts out. That's another way to fund this kind of research, especially though, if you get an interdisciplinary team. We get a group of faculty. We have a better shot of getting that kind of money. And if you get external money, it sometimes makes it a little easier than you know trying to find it here on campus. Um, and it, it also then looks good for the students. It looks good for the school. Uh, that's another way to help fund this kind of stuff. 
We're about out of time. We did have that one last slide about yeah. like what a symposium could look like yeah. if we had one someday. But this is, I think, conversations of the future. If we get enough people, so go tell your colleagues like yeah. what you do, what you think you could do, and then we can start to, you know, we could have a we could have that here someday, right? A poster presentation that all any students across campus doing work could be a part of. Do you want yeah, to yeah. Again, right this on? was something I did at the university that I started out at years ago, and it was me uh, becoming friends with the head of the grants office and saying, well, you know, why don't we look into doing this? Um, and this went with that presidential research scholarship. We had a campus-wide um, symposium for research and also creative works to where you would do things that would be sort of performance. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, you know, you have poster presentations of research. You could have people doing artwork, 2D and 3D. Uh, someone that does videos. Uh, and then you get into the whole oral presentations and uh, instrumental performances. And I think that that could be uh, something that maybe is more formalized within uh, our classes here. But it could also be students that are doing maybe musical stuff on their side. I got two guys in one of my classes that are working on some uh, hip hop stuff. <laughs> We'd have to find out what that really means, but uh, anyway, reading the poetry and literature, and then just whatever format's appropriate to the discipline, uh, that if we get everybody there, uh, I think it will, it, it'll, it'll be a richer experience for the students. And also I think it will help us find support for this from the administration. I think someone wants to say something, yeah, so I'll stop talking. Yeah, let me go back over to the chat. I usually have a second. Um, oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Angela. Yes. We appreciate it. And yes, Maxie, exactly. So a symposium. And I think that um, thinking it as a science fair is one way. I think that the, the word that Rudy used as showcase yeah. is really another important way to think about it because then it, it takes away like the focus on science and it really showcases all of the talent and all of the research yes. that we're, pass, we're capable of across the campus. And that's really kind of one of the major messages we want to get through is that research looks different in different disciplines and different fields, but it's all meaningful and creating that culture here is really the ultimate goal. The other thing I think it does is it opens possibilities of where they may go. Because yes. it's a community yeah. college, a yeah. lot of my students at least don't know what field they want to go into. Right. So exposing them to different projects, not necessarily in the science space or whatever it happens yeah. to, to be, allows them to look at other opportunities and other professions that they may not have looked at. Absolutely. So kind of going along those lines of like helping students commit to a path and stay on that path. And, right. and that's one of the things um, we have, you know, just a list of resources. Again, we'll share this with you, but that's one of the things that many of our resources kind of repeat over and over again. It's one of the major benefits of these types of experiences is that students become more well committed to their career path because they see what the possibilities are. Um, so again, these are just a few different examples of you know, what that data is showing us and some of the resources where we kind of collected that data. It also helps with collaboration because you don't work by yourself. Right. I mean, you need to work with other people. And so how to collaborate with others, how to make an impact. Um, that would be great, Matt. Yeah, the coordinator <laughs> to organize yes. the symposium. You Are you volunteering? <laughs> I think you would be great at it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Well, well, thank you, everyone. With that, yes, we'll finish.